What's going on, everybody, and welcome to another tremendous special edition of the Bombastic Podcast presented by Natty State Sports and hosted by yours truly, Andrew Ellis. These are chaotic times here, Hog fans. This is a uh, this is a very tumultuous time to be an Arkansas Razorback fan. Uh, of course, I am referring to everything going on at the, the basketball program, the men's basketball program or in particular, although I guess the women's are pretty chaotic at this point as well. Um, but guys... I have good things to share for you because here we don't talk about any of that weird stuff. We don't talk about those lesser programs who have all this controversy and you don't even know if the head coach wants the job or anything. You know who ain't leaving? You know who wants to coach at Arkansas? Dave freaking Van Horn. And he's got the number one team in the country, the Arkansas Razorbacks, the Diamond Hogs. Uh, and that's what we're here to talk about. Um, so this is your safe space. Everybody just go ahead and get in now. Bring your friends in. This is a safe space. We are only going to talk about the good stuff here. And not because we're homers and because we don't acknowledge that there are bad things that happen. And uh, if if this baseball team is ever going to lose a series, then I will come on here and talk about it. But they don't seem to be doing that. They 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 have not been losing a ton lately. They are now 24 and 3 after a dominant win against Arkansas State, the Red Wolves. Uh puts put to put a little whooping on their their uh, their boy Case and Tallette. From Little Rock, you know, former hog. Um, but yeah, we're going to get into all of it. And I just want to let you guys know, we will not be discussing all the chaotic stuff that's going on outside the sports world because this is this is the place where we have fun. This is the place where we know what we're what to expect. Good, solid baseball. Uh, a program that's going to make us proud. A program that's going to offer a lot of highs and a lot of fun moments. And it's going to take care of us through the end of June. And... Uh, Things are just now starting to heat up for this Arkansas baseball team, and we we had a really productive week last week. It was a banner week for the Bombastic Podcast. We had back to back episodes that were our like highest, most viewed, most downloaded, most appreciated, most loved. Uh, we had some people saying nice things to me in the comments, a few mean things here and there, but you know, I really appreciated all the support. Everybody tuning in. Uh, feels like we're we're catching a little bit of momentum here. Not just me. I mean, selfishly, I like to view everything through my own lens, of course. Uh, but I mean, also just Arkansas baseball. It really, like I said last episode, it really is starting to feel like baseball season. And for a baseball guy like me, that just makes me very happy. Uh, Eric Musselman uh, once again tried to throw a wrench in this plan by having this whole coaching controversy go on, and I'm almost certain it's going to play out while Arkansas is playing Ole Miss. But hopefully, it takes place during the day so that. We will be able to go live and have you covered here at Natty State Studios and also just so it doesn't get, get in the way of more important things, which are the Arkansas Razorbacks, the number one team in the country. They are hosting Ole Miss, the 2022 national champions who, as you may you may know, defeated Arkansas, eliminated them from the College World Series. Um, it's always really fun when these two teams get together. I always love watching it. I mean, the games are always way closer than they probably should be. Like, even when, when these teams don't necessarily line up on paper. Like last year, for example, Ole Miss was, you know, one of the worst teams in the SEC last year. Didn't make the tournament uh, or kind of had kind of had a disastrous season as the defending national champions. But Arkansas had to fight and scratch and claw just to win that series last year in Oxford. I think they were only, like, there was only a few. I guess they, they won by, like, one or two in that game three. It's like on Easter weekend. I remember that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that just tells you, like, you can never really – overlook anyone in the SEC but I think these two teams no matter how good or bad they are on either side it always seems like it's going to be a close series and there was a while there where Arkansas it seemed like Ole Miss had their number um you know back in the day I feel like Mike Bianco has has kind of had the upper hand in the series I haven't done the the real the real math to see like what the overall record is between he and DVH at this point I'm sure DVH has closed that gap a little bit but uh this is a series that for many of you may be pretty personal uh, Ole Miss is not like my least favorite team in the SEC. I mean, Arkansas just played my least favorite team in the SEC in LSU. I don't hate Ole Miss with that much vigor, but this is a series that's kind of personal for me. Like I, you know, I hate Ole Miss. I don't, I don't like watching those dudes. Uh, they're a very easy team to cheer against. And I've watched Arkansas lose to this team a ton and this program over the years. Watched Arkansas had some really good moments against Ole Miss, like in 2019, the Super Regional, eliminating uh, Doug Nikhazy, the booger eater. And, uh, you know, sending those guys home. Like, there's there's plenty of good moments on both sides of that, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this series, and we'll talk a little bit more about the matchup and kind of where Arkansas is catching Ole Miss and how it, how it lines up and what the situation is on paper. Uh, but before we do that, I do want to give a quick shout-out 
to our boys at Alumni Hall. Um, guys, it's that time of year where the weather is starting to change slowly but surely. It's still cold and windy today, or at least it was this morning when I left. Um, but the weather's starting to change. It's starting to get a little warmer. This summer is starting to, you know, it's it's on the horizon here. So you might need some new clothes, might need some new merch, new hog merch, because if you're going to go out to Bomb and support the team, which you should be doing, uh, Bomb has been a lot. It's just a really fun place to be these days. And uh, this past weekend, the weather was a lot better than it is today. And uh, I know the crowds were rowdy as hell. So if you're a part of that or you're looking to be a part of that and you're planning on coming up for a game, don't go empty-handed. Make sure you got the most up-to-date, perfect Razorback gear that fits you. Head on over to Alumni Hall on, on 3417 North College Avenue. Buy the Whole Foods where Curtis is getting his groceries. Uh, the ultimate Razorback shopping destination. Truly the best place to get Arkansas merchandise. Uh, some of my buddies, by the way, Alumni Hall, I didn't. I guess I didn't realize that they have like situations everywhere else like not everywhere else but i think it's like a nashville thing that started but they have them in baton rouge they have them in these other sec campuses and my buddies were like dude i love alumni hall like, I, I get stuff from there all the time uh they're great anywhere you are so if you're listening to this and you're not an arkansas fan see if you've got an alumni hall nearby go check those dudes out but for you hog fans i would love i would strongly urge you to go get all your stuff whether it's hats shirts shorts uh, picnic tables, like whatever, stuff for your dog, stuff for your kids, stuff for your granny, your dad, your uncle, whatever. Uh, Alumni Hall, you will not be dis- disappointed with their selection and what they have going on. And if you can't make it to the store, you're not in Fayetteville, you can't, you know, you know, maybe it's just too busy, you don't have enough time in the day, whatever, you can shop online, nattystatesports.com slash alumni hall. If you click on that, or if you go to that link, and, and it'll take you right to the website that has all your options, you can buy stuff directly from the store, uh, that'll be the best way you could support them, support us, support the Hogs, which I know all of you guys want to do. Those three things should be things you want to do. Uh, so go check out those boys over at Alumni Hall, um, guys. I'm I'm be honest with you. I'm kind of kind of geeked up today. <laughs> Just a little backstory. I don't know why I decided to tell this, but so on the way to work, we do this thing a lot where like one of us goes somewhere and we're all going to the same location. So you know, like like good buddies do, I'll text in the group and I'll be like, hey, anybody want anything from Sonic? Because I go to Sonic damn near every day. Be like, hey, anybody want anything from Sonic? Or if I go to Seven Brew, sometimes I'll be like, hey, anybody want some coffee? Like, what's going on? Uh, my boy Scotty Bordelon texted us at 7.30 this morning and was like, hey, does anybody want any Seven Brew? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping at Seven Brew. Send your orders now. I read that text, and my reaction was, I ain't trying to get to work that early, so I'm not going to respond because I don't want to have to get to work that early and just to get my Seven Brew or whatever and don't have to make them put it in the fridge for me or whatever. But I did go to Sonic on my way to work, and then Sin was like, hey, anybody want to see anything from Sonic? And nobody responded. So I was just kind of cool with my Sonic drink, just to give me some caffeine, get me going in the day. And then when I get there, Scotty's like, hey, man, I went ahead and got you a, a nice iced blondie because I know you like that. Uh, I just you know, thought you might could use it, even though I didn't respond to the text, which one says a lot about Scotty and what kind of man he is. He's a great man. And he and Curtis have been crushing it with his basketball stuff. This is a shameless plug for them as well. Go check out all the stuff they've got going on. Uh, Scotty actually was not there yesterday. Curtis flew solo on the pot at the Palace. But as soon as anything happens with Eric Musselman officially, they will be going live. I might be going live with them. John's, we've got a whole setup to where, like, literally I told them, if it happens right now, come yell at me and we will <laughs> we will alter the podcast or whatever. We will go live right away to give you the updated coverage of that. But Curtis and Scotty have been crushing it with that. But back to my seven brew rant. Uh, so Scotty just got me some seven brew unprompted. Dad didn't even ask for it. Uh, which is very nice of him and sweet of him. But it also now is leading to a little bit of a caffeine overload. So I'm kind of buzzing right now. I, uh, I'm not quite done with my seven brew, but by the end of this podcast, I might be jumping off the walls. So I'm amped up, ready to talk ball. Um, but before we get into Arkansas Ole Miss, uh, I purposely have not even checked the SEC baseball schedule this weekend because I wanted to kind of leave it as a treat to surprise myself and kind of react to it in real time in front of you guys. So we're just going to take a quick little peek through the schedule like we tend to do. Um, by the way, guys, if y'all hate this, if y'all don't like when I talk about non-Arkansas SEC uh, stuff and just kind of look at whatever's going on, let me know. I haven't heard, had anyone complain about it, but I just realized I'm like, I'm kind of setting aside five to ten minutes to do this, and people might not love it. So if you don't like it, let me know. I always, I really do. I say it on just about every podcast. I do really appreciate you guys' feedback, and I take it into consideration all the time. Like, if you hate something I do or say. I actually had someone DM me and basically told me to stop cursing because his son listens to my podcast, uh, which, you know, I forgot the guy's name. I believe it's Jay. Uh, Shout out to you, Jay. Shout out to your son. I'm not going to tailor my entire podcast to your son or to you or whatever, but I do appreciate you guys' feedback, and I take it in consideration. 
I actually texted my dad yesterday, and I was like, Dad, I don't think this is the first podcast I did. Bombastic, no cursing. So I know he appreciates it. I hope Jay and his boy appreciated it. Uh, no promises that I'm going to do that moving forward, but I do like to take you guys' feedback into account. But uh, since nobody has told me not to, I'm just going to take a quick little peek through the SEC schedule, see what's going on around the league, because in my opinion, it's the most fun league to observe in pretty much any sport. Uh, there's always fun matchups. I'm sure this weekend will be no different. So let's just take a look. So obviously Ole Miss in Fayetteville playing Arkansas. We know what's going on there. We'll get into that later. Uh, right off the bat, on Thursday night, the other Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. So Arkansas is going to be playing on SEC Network tomorrow night. On ESPN2, at the same time, Vanderbilt is taking a trip to Baton Rouge to play LSU in Alex Box Stadium. That is a very good series right there. Very high level, two really talented teams. LSU, who is now, I mean, as you guys know, 2-7 and seven in SEC play. I, I got a text from my buddy Michael Beck. He was just telling me, man, I, don't, I, think, I think we might get swept again, man. This is, this is a tough one. Uh, LSU's first five, first four or five series in conference play, they have Tennessee next week. Just a gauntlet, man. Like, that's tough. So, I mean, the defending national champs, their back's against the wall. I believe they just lost last night to Southern. Was that last night? Yeah, it was last night they lost to Southern. No, uh, man, it's it's looking bleak for the LSU Tigers. We'll see what happens here. Uh, actually, it was Monday night they lost to Southern. But anyways, big time, high leverage, high stakes series, high pressure for the LSU Tigers. Uh, SECsports.com has this as number seven versus number 18. I feel like LSU is closer to like 25. I don't know what poll they're going off of. But this could be a situation where you could see the defending national champions leave the rankings if they don't come away with a series win here. And they, if they don't win the series, they'd be three and nine at best in SEC play. Keep an eye on that one because that is a very big series. And, you know, Vanderbilt six and three, they've kind of appeared to be one of the better teams in the country in the SEC. Uh, will they make a nice little statement similar to how Arkansas did? Obviously, they got to go on the road, but that's a big time series there to keep your eye on. Another really important one to keep your eye on two future Arkansas opponents. Uh, the Alabama Crimson Tide, who are four and five in SEC play and have been playing pretty well, got some, you know, had some up and down results, but they've been pretty good for the most part. They're currently ranked number 13th, according to this. They are going to Lexington, to Kentucky, who, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know is like the freaking hottest team in the SEC, who it says seven and one in SEC play. That doesn't quite make sense because you sh they should have nine SEC games under their belt. Um, but I know that they beat Missouri two out of three, swept Ole Miss, who we will talk about later. They swept Ole Miss in Oxford last weekend. Uh, who else did they sweep? They swept Georgia to open SEC play. So it's like it's it's been a really loud start to SEC play for the Kentucky Wildcats against Alabama, who's coming off of a series win, I believe, against South Carolina. Yeah, they're definitely coming off a series win, which is, I thought was an impressive one at home. Uh, kind of a big time moment for Alabama. If they win this series on the road in Lexington, you got to start really taking those dudes seriously. They'd probably jump up into the near the top 10 at that point. Uh, and Kentucky, who just like, I feel like me and a lot of other people are kind of just like waiting for the other shoe to drop with Kentucky. Like, all right, when are they going to kind of chill out a little bit? I thought that Ole Miss would give them a lot more competitive of a series last week, but they swept those dudes on the road. It's time to maybe take these dudes seriously. And so if they, they're able to add to that, add another series win to their resume against Alabama. Now all of a sudden you're looking at like a surefire tournament team and a team that is going to be in that hosting national seed conversation and maybe even have a chance to win the SEC East, which would be pretty remarkable for Kentucky, uh, who really haven't been, ha hasn't had a notable team in a few years here now. Uh, that's a big-time series to keep your eye on. And boy, every time I scroll down, there's an even cooler series uh, A&M, number three in the country, six and three in SEC play, played really well the last couple weekends. They are going to South Carolina, who has had a really fascinating start to SEC play. Uh, South Carolina, who lo lost a series to Ole Miss at one, I think it was to open SEC play, which at the time didn't seem like a big deal, but in hindsight, it's like, damn, you lost a series to Ole Miss. Like, what are you doing? Uh, they end up sweeping. Vanderbilt, which is as loud of a series win as you could possibly have, and then they drop a series to Alabama. So it's like little Jacqueline Hyde there with South Carolina. Uh, Columbia is not an easy place to play, not a super easy park to go to. You guys may remember the Robert Moore Oompa Loompa chants and stuff like that, but it's a really nice park. Uh, you're talking about a program that won back-to-back -back national championships back in 08, 09, so they care about their baseball over in Columbia. That's a sneaky, tough test for uh, Texas A&M, the Aggies who honestly like are just outright terrifying just 
with what they've been doing this year. They're now 26 and three. So record wise, I mean, in the SEC play, they're a couple games behind Arkansas, but A&M is kind of the big matchup looming for Arkansas, in my opinion. Like it feels like Arkansas and A&M are on a crash course toward one another. Uh, that series for them is going to be a sneaky good one. If they go out there and put a whooping on South Carolina, you guys better be be on red alert and be like, oh crap, like these Aggies, man, it's not going to be fun. But I could see I could see the Gamecocks having. I mean, they swept Vanderbilt last time they were in this park, so we'll see if they're able to build on that and put together another big time series win for their resume. That's a good little series right there. Uh, you also have Auburn going to now. <laughs> okay, this. This site is just, they're, they're just botching a lot of things. They have the rankings wrong. This is secsports.com I'm going off, by the way. So you take it up with them. It's not my fault. They have Auburn's record at 24 and 5 and 5 and 4 in SEC play. I know for a fact that is not true. Uh, <laughs> I just know that's not their record. But Auburn is going to number four, Tennessee. Maybe that's their record. Uh, they're going at to Knoxville to play them. Another just absolutely brutal series for Auburn. Dude. I actually joked with DVH about this. Uh, he didn't think it was that funny. But I was joking with DVH. Where I was like, dude, you might have to put in a call to the league office because Auburn's schedule is just brutal. Like, I feel so bad for them because they're not a bad baseball team. I mean, they, they're the only team in the SEC to beat Arkansas so far. Uh, they're not like a bad team. Not necessarily a good team either. I wouldn't. I don't think they're like a threat or anything. They're 1-8 and eight in SEC play, and it doesn't feel indicative of like what I've been seeing when I watch them. Kind of tough, and they've lost a lot of close games. Can they get over the hump and maybe take a series here against uh, Tennessee? Really tall task to ask of them. Uh, Tennessee, who's been pretty good for the most part, but haven't really, like, their number four, it says here, haven't been playing, like, lights out ball, though they did finish their series against Georgia in pretty impressive fashion. Run ruled Ole Miss a couple times last week, but they haven't had a weekend where they've just, like, blown someone out of the water, swept them, and, like, made quick work of them. They could obviously do that here against Auburn, but I think that series is going to be a little bit closer than many think. Uh, and then rounding it out, we got a couple of quick series to touch on here. Georgia, who is, again, just kind of a fascinating team that is very, will sweep a team, but then will get swept and just kind of nobody really knows what to make of them. They can't pitch at all, which is kind of funny because Wes Johnson is their head coach. But they are going on the road at Mississippi State, who I've been really impressed with when I watch. They're only 4-5 and five in SEC play, still hanging on to a top 25 ranking. I think this is a good chance for Mississippi State to get back on track and win a series here at home. Uh, they were really close. They had a chance to win every single game against Florida when they were in Gainesville last weekend. Like I mentioned, blew a two-run lead in the ninth inning in game one, blew a one-run lead in the ninth inning in game three, run-rolled those dudes in game two. So it's like, you know, there's an alternate universe in which Mississippi State's coming off a sweep over over Florida, which would have been pretty impressive. Uh, I think they're going to take care of business here in this series against Georgia. But that's an interesting one to keep your eye on. And then Missouri, who, uh, guys, I want to, I just, they're hosting number six Florida this weekend. I couldn't believe my eyes when I just saw the numbers earlier. Missouri is hitting 144 in SEC play, and they are slugging 202. That's unreal. That's just unreal incompetence offensively. Obviously, they only scored one run in that series against Arkansas. And so, you know, when you've only played three SEC series and you have one like that, it's going to loom large. But, man, just have not done a ton here in SEC plays. So that's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty fascinating stuff there. But that's what's going on in the SEC this weekend. I uh, just wanted to kind of touch on some of that stuff before we get into the real meat and potatoes of what the Hogs got going on this weekend. Hmm. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about Ole Miss and what they have been doing. So let's go through their schedule here real quick. Like I said, they win their opening series against South Carolina to start SEC play. That's a very respectable series win. Like that's, you know, starting two and one against South Carolina, like you you look at that and you're like, hey, this is a pretty good team. Like this this makes sense. Like, okay, they'll probably uh, now they were at home. Uh they win game one, five to four, win game two, twelve to three, and then South Carolina avoids a sweep, wins six to two on the road. Then they start, they go to Knoxville. Get run ruled in game one, 15 to three. Uh, they come back and win game two on Saturday, eight to five. And again, at this point, so now you're three and two in SEC play. You're going into a rubber match with Tennessee, who's a really good team, but it's like you're kind of in position to win that series a little bit or at least making it competitive. You get run ruled on Sunday, 15 to four. A little bit of a tough blow. Now you're three and three in SEC play. Kind of got to bounce back. You're back at home now against Kentucky, and it's like, all right, let's just get a series win, get back on track. And uh, not only did they not get a series win, 
they rolled over and just said, "Hey, pet our belly. We're we're done. We quit. Just go ahead and just go ahead and uh, do whatever you want to do to us." They lose game one, five to three. Again, not a like blowout. They're just they're kind of still in it, but it's like it's a tough game one loss. And then seventeen to nine on Saturday, fifteen to one. You get run ruled again on Sunday. And now here you are, you're three and six in SEC play. You just blew it, got swept at home against Kentucky, who is not a like super notable program. Now you got to go on the road to Arkansas and play the Razorbacks. Just a like a really tough vibe. And uh, so there's, you know, anybody I talk to from Ole Miss, I have a buddy who went there, who I actually haven't talked to this weekend, but anyone I talk to at Ole Miss, like they really do not like Mike Bianco. I need people to understand that. Obviously, Mike Bianco has been at Ole Miss for longer than I've been alive. Like the dude's been there. I think him and DVH are like the two, him, DVH, and maybe Corbin at uh, Vanderbilt are like the three longest tenured coaches in the SEC by like a fat margin. Uh, you know, these guys have been playing against each other forever. Mike Bianco's had plenty of success at Ole Miss, but for a long time, it was like, you know, a lot of regular season success. Can he get over that hump? He hasn't really put together a run. And uh, many people don't remember this. In 2022, Ole Miss started off pitiful in SEC play. I don't remember what it was, but there was a point where like they were not projected to make the NCAA tournament. And it really wasn't even that close. I remember when they came to Fayetteville in 2022, they lose a series two to three. That felt like it was like they had just lost to Mississippi State the week before. It felt like that was kind of it. Whereas like if they could win this series, maybe they could make it back, but they lose a series to Arkansas. Uh, they went on a little bit of a run down the stretch, but it felt like a little bit of a too little too late. They go to Hoover that year. Uh, on In the first game of Hoover, which is at that point in time was single elimination, still is, but next year it won't be. They lose their first game in Hoover, which is like if you're trying to make the NCAA tournament, you're on that bubble. Like, kind of felt like a must win for Ole Miss. They lose that game, and I was in Hoover that year. There were fans screaming stuff at Mike Bianco, like, this guy sucks, fire him, get him out of here. Any fan you talk to from Ole Miss, unanimous hatred for the dude. They were like, this dude, it's run his course, get him out of here. Like, we're done with this. Uh, Mike Bianco's family. His son, Drew Bianco, who played at LSU and transferred out somewhere, he was there. They were, like, getting into it with fans. It was, a, like, it was a tough scene. And I remember just being like, damn, like, that's how the Mike Bianco era is going to end here. Like, how about that? Uh, Ole Miss, somehow, the NCAA tournament committee, I don't know how they decided to throw Ole Miss in there. Ole Miss had almost eliminated themselves by just, like, they, I mean, literally, they were about to fire Mike Bianco, like, that Monday. Somehow, on Selection Sunday, Ole Miss is the last team in the tournament uh, I can't remember whose regional they got put in. It was like maybe Miami. They go down there and smoke those dudes, uh, win that regional. I believe they beat Southern Miss in the Super Regional. They go on to Omaha. They put together this crazy run. They had a team that had just like all juniors and seniors. Uh, they put together a run, and they meet Arkansas, and they beat Arkansas once, lose a game to Arkansas, which is one of the best games I've ever watched, come back and beat them in an elimination game, and they go on to win the national title. There you go. Uh, and all of a sudden, Mike Bianco's not fired, and uh, he's sticking around for a while. I bring that up to say, as soon as they won the national title, they went right back to sucking again. They missed the tournament last year, really didn't have much going on there. Uh, you know, people were kind of getting frustrated again. Like, you give them some leeway when you win a national title, obviously, but Ole Miss just goes right back in the shitter. Uh, missed the tournament last year. So they're three and six now in SEC play. They're about to play Arkansas. Could really be looking at three and nine. They might miss the tournament again this year. If they do it again, I really, truly, in my heart, think there's a chance Mike Bianco is not their head coach next year, which is just kind of crazy to say about a guy who one is such a like such an established and respected figure in college baseball, and rightfully so. I mean, as a player, had an awesome career, uh, wins national titles with LSU, him and Ben McDonald. Uh, has been at Ole Miss for like 50 years, had a lot of sustained success, ton of regular season, postseason, has the the ring to cap it off, like such a respected figure. I really don't – I think this is like a not, – not a make or break year because, I mean, this dude's already made it. Uh, I could see a situation in which he is not their head coach, if not this year, next year for sure. Like going if they miss the tournament again this year, I don't know how you don't go into the next year like with some serious concern, but I also think they would have a tough decision to make in the offseason – uh, so I just feel like that background info was relevant here where it's like, you, you know that Ole Miss won the title in 2022. So I think some from afar might just think like, ah, oh, it's, you know, they're struggling, but like, it is what it is. Like, I think the situation is a lot more dire and hostile there in Oxford than people realize. 
And uh, let's talk a little bit about this year's team and why it's a little little bit weird. So just looking at the SEC only numbers. So these are these are stats that I'm about to read you only from SEC play, which honestly is just a better way to judge a team than looking at their overall stats because we're still at that point, only three weeks in the SEC play. You played nine games. Nine games may seem like a lot, but in baseball when you've played 30 so far, it's really only like, you know, not even a third of your season. Uh, but, you know, SEC play, you know you're playing good competition. Ole Miss is dead last in the SEC in ERA, 9.37. Pretty wild. Uh, opponents batting average, 312. That's 12th in the SEC. They've walked 45 guys. That's also 12th in the SEC. They've allowed the most home runs in the league at 21. Uh, they're third most in hit by pitches at 11. Oh, and by the way, they're the worst fielding team in the SEC. They've got a 957 fielding percentage, most errors in the league. Uh, really just struggling to get 27 innings throughout a weekend. And if you remember, you know, if you uh, rewind about seven minutes when I was kind of reading their schedule, you kind of see the, st- the, the statistics and how it lines up where it's like Friday night they'll lose like five to three, and you're like, okay, okay. Then the next game they give up 17. And then the next game it's like, they can have moments here and there where the pitching staff, like they got some older guys in the bullpen, some uh, some talented starters there we'll get into a little bit later. Uh, but it just doesn't seem like stringing together three straight games of consistently decent pitching is something that Ole Miss is capable of doing here. And uh, their lineup is talented, it has some, some nice little pieces there, but it's not a special one that's like any different than any other SEC lineup. I'd say, honestly, offensively, they're doing about what Arkansas is doing. Uh, So if you want to know the answer to, hey, what if Arkansas, instead of having the best pitching staff in the SEC, had the worst pitching staff in the SEC, Ole Miss is what they would look like, basically. Because offensively, these teams are actually pretty pretty comparable. Uh, Just taking a quick look at the numbers. So in SEC play, Ole Miss hitting 261, which is just a little bit. They're right above Arkansas, who's hitting 251. I believe it's like 8th and ninth, or ninth and 10th or something like that. Uh, But they haven't been slugging a ton if you look at Ole Miss's numbers for the year, you would think they have a you know a decent amount of power. I think they've had 45 home runs on the year. It's like right around middle of the pack in the SEC, maybe even a little bit higher. But in SEC play, they're ninth in slugging percentage at 442, and their on-base percentage is 355. They're 12th in total bases. Like, have not had a ton of sustained, consistent success on offense either, and their power is just not really not really translated to SEC play. Um, so you know, I think there's still plenty of questions about whether or not this team can do anything right like they don't really have a clear and identifiable strength uh they don't have a ton of pieces like LSU who is also bad and has a worse record than Ole Miss actually at this point at least they have a legitimate ace in Luke Holman they've got some talented bullpen pieces they've got maybe the best hitter in the country and Tommy White ton of power in their lineup at the top so it's like there's at least stuff you can hang your hat on Ole Miss is just kind of a disjointed, like there's talent here and there, decent players, like some names you'll recognize, like uh, Ethan Leger, Ethan Groff, like these are guys, Will Furness, who's, you know, the the name Furness holds a lot of weight in the SEC. Uh, And in their bullpen, they've got a few guys like Mason Nichols, who's been around. Uh, I forget, is it Josh Mal? Yeah, Josh Malice is another guy who's been around, but their older guys, especially on the pitching side, have just really not, not lived up to their billing so far. Um, one of their starters, maybe their most fascinating starter to me is a guy named Liam Doyle. He's a left-handed pitcher who, when he entered the portal, I think this reminds me, I need to unfollow him on Twitter. When he entered the portal from Coastal Carolina, I remember being like really excited. Like, oh, this is a dude like Arkansas needs to be in on. He could be like a potential setup, like closing piece for Arkansas. This would be huge. Uh, so I followed him on Twitter. I was like really kind of talking myself into him being an Arkansas Razorback. Uh, he ends up he ends up transferring to Ole Miss, and he started the year really well. His strikeout numbers, so see an SEC play, he's got 21 strikeouts in 14 innings. I don't know what it is for the year, but his strikeout numbers early were crazy. Uh, he's got really good stuff, like can pump it up to the mid 90s with his fastball. Really like repeatable delivery. Like he's a dude that is a brutal at bat for left handed pitching or left handed batters. Um, they've tried to transition him into a starting role. And he's had his moments, but he got really roughed up against Kentucky. He gave up six runs and two and two thirds. I think he had given up like three or four runs with ten strikeouts the week before. So he's a little bit of a, you know, hit or miss kind of guy here. 
I think that's a, that's an arm where like if I'm going into this weekend, you see Ole Miss's team ERA nine thirty seven, Liam Doyle's ERA who I just mentioned an SEC play at seven seventy one. It's like five something, six something for the year. Uh, you may see that and be like, hey, this guy sucks. How come he's pitching well against Arkansas? I just want you know wanted to let y'all know that because I, there's always these pieces where I'm like. Fans are going to see this and see Arkansas get shut out by a guy with a 7 ERA and be like, what the hell? This guy's really good. Uh, but he's kind of like like a lot of these pieces at Ole Miss, really talented pieces who seem to be underachieving a little bit. The other two guys that Ole Miss has been starting on the weekend, Grayson Saunier and Gunnar Dennis, Gunnar Dennis also a left-handed pitcher, have ERAs of 1530 and 1736 respectively in SEC play. Uh, none of these three guys, I mean, Doyle has 14 innings pitched and three SEC starts uh, before last weekend when he didn't get through the third inning, had actually been pretty good at giving them some depth, five, six innings in SEC play. So he's probably your best chance to get a legitimate like quality start out of. But that's the biggest difference to me with these two teams is the starting pitching could not be further. Like there could not be a larger discrepancy between how good Arkansas starting pitching has been and how bad Ole Misses has been. And uh, just kind of looking at some of their bullpen numbers, there's some nice pieces here and there. Uh, Mitch Morell has thrown four and a third, scoreless in SEC play. Uh, their closer, Connor Spencer, has a couple saves, but he's only made two appearances in SEC play, went one inning each. So it's like there's some talented pieces here in this bullpen, but they don't have a bullpen arm that is consistently giving them any type of depth, can go like three, four innings in a start or in an outing. Uh, their starters haven't really been giving them depth. So it's like, you really look at the numbers and you see how it adds up. Uh, that's how you have a 937 ERA at SEC play. If you have talented arms that are underachieving and none of them are really guys you can just lean on and say, hey, go give us five, six innings. Just go give us five. Or, hey, it's a blowout. We need you to just eat the ball for four innings. Like, for instance, Austin Ledbetter, who is no longer even with the Arkansas baseball program. Uh, he's, you know, now playing football. Shout out to Austin Ledbetter, QB1. Uh, even him, like Arkansas had a guy like that last year who, if they needed, could just throw him out there and be like, hey, this game's kind of gotten away from us. Just just go out there and throw strikes and just see what you can do. And he'll, he'll, he could give you four or five innings. I think he threw five innings in the NCAA tournament for Arkansas against TCU. Ole Miss doesn't even have guys like that who can just go out there and just eat up innings. It's been a real disaster. I mean, I, I read you some of the numbers of how many game, how many high run totals they've given up in SEC play. There's like a 15, a 17, a 12, a 14. Like, it just seems like one game per weekend at least really gets away from them, and they're not able to uh, to figure it out or stop the bleeding. So it's like really uh, if you're if you're an Arkansas lineup, obviously you can't afford to overlook anyone. This is, this is one you have to have circled as like we got to make these dudes pay. And uh, one of the keys to the weekend, at least for me, so going into last weekend, we talked about it a little bit, Arkansas was kind of bottom three or four in the SEC in walks, which is not something that we are accustomed to because Arkansas, even when they're struggling at the plate and struggling with hit with runners in scoring position, they're usually drawing free passes, taking their walks, getting hit by pitch, like making pitchers work, whatever the case may be. Last week was kind of the first time that we started to see them get back to that kind of an approach, more of a patient approach, and uh, – LSU leads the SEC in walks now, and they were up there like top three going into the weekend. Arkansas figures, you know, we sh we, we learned last weekend that if you want to walk Arkansas, they will let you. Uh, so I feel like that was a very notable development. I mentioned Ole Miss is like top three in the SEC in walks with 45. Uh, I guess I also should mention, since I'm just, I'm just shitting on these dudes so much, I should also mention that Ole Miss is six in the SEC in pitching, ER, or, uh, pitching strikeouts with 80 in SEC play. So it's not like, again, you're going to see some decent stuff here. You're going to see some 92, 93. You're going to see some dudes running up there to 95. You're going to see lefties. Like, there's some talented guys here in this Ole Miss pitching staff. Like, there will be moments where you're like, hey, how does this team have a 937 ERA? Uh, I think the key for this weekend is, like I said, working those walks. But also, you know this pitching staff does not have any depth. You know that there's only, like, three guys that they even somewhat halfway trust uh, the key, I think, to me is just getting those good arms out of the game, getting them on to the next guy, whether it's a starter that's on the mound, get to that bullpen as quickly as you can because you know that the more Ole Miss runs out these options, they're eventually going to throw you a ticking time bomb that you can explode. Uh, at least that's just how I view it here. Who knows? Maybe this Arkansas offense will look anemic and not really get anything going, but uh, uh, this was not as you know detailed of a breakdown 
uh, as, as I had for the LSU series, mostly because I think this team is, I mean, we can sit here and go through the pieces if you guys really want. Uh, one min- one person I will mention in the Ole Miss lineup, uh, I mentioned that their power hasn't really translated to SEC play. The one exception to that would be Andrew Fisher, who has, I think, 11 home runs on the year for them, has five of those in SEC play. Kind of crazy in SEC play. He's got five home runs and seven RBI. So it just tells you, like, even their power hitters, like, are not able to have the swings that really, like, not coming away with those two, three-run home runs and more a lot of solo home runs in there. Uh, but I just don't, you know, this is a more talented team than their early, some of these numbers indicate. It's not a bad Ole Miss lineup. It's like every other SEC lineup. Your top five or six guys, dudes that can really make you pay, can do a lot of damage, can, you know, really put pressure on you. It kind of falls off a little bit after that. Uh, I feel like with a lot of these SEC teams, the, the margin is just not that big. Like there's not really a huge difference between the Ole Miss lineup and the LSU lineup and the LSU lineup and the Auburn lineup. Like I think all three of these are actually, believe it or not, pretty similar. I would say LSU is probably the best, has a little bit more uh, notable names and notable options there that can make you pay. But I don't think there's a ton of separation between a lot of these these uh, these lineups that we see here. Um, also, I did <laughs> this. This actually kind of stuck out to me. So Arkansas now leads the SEC in walks during conference play, which is freaking hilarious. Because, I mean, one, it's just small, it kind of tells you small sample size, but because going into the weekend for the year, they were like 11th overall. So now they're number one in the walks in SEC play. Uh, but just to tell you how small that margin is, Tennessee is 10th in the SEC for walks as a lineup uh, with 36. So only nine w- fewer walks than Arkansas, basically one per game less. And they're 10th compared to Arkansas's one. Uh, there's three teams with 45 walks. Kentucky's got 43, A&M, Mississippi State, and Georgia all with 40. Like When I say there's not a ton of margin offensively for a lot of these SEC teams, there's just really not, and uh, the scoring numbers are a little bit more drastic. But uh, really, there's just a lot of teams kind of hitting in that 250 to 280 range, that like 5 through 10. It's kind of all pretty similar. Um, And so I think Ole Miss is kind of right in there with it. Offensively, this is not going to be a team that like has anything that you haven't seen before that this Arkansas pitching staff hasn't seen before. Um, although one thing I will one of the one of the more interesting notes to watch here is Ole Miss is last in the SEC in strikeouts in SEC play. Now again, we're talking small sample sizes. Like last last week, this time last week, Arkansas was last in the SEC for strikeouts. Then they faced a really good SEC pitching staff in LSU. Strikes out a ton of people. They moved up a little bit. I expect something here to happen this weekend where Ole Miss strikes out a little bit more than they are used to because they're facing an Arkansas pitching staff. Uh, so it could go one of two ways. Will Arkansas not be able to strike out Ole Miss? In which case, will Ar- will Ole Miss be able to maybe? identify some weaknesses in that Arkansas pitching staff. Uh, what I think is more likely is that this Ole Miss lineup, which hasn't been doing a ton of damage but hasn't been striking out, might just start striking out and still not doing that damage. We might see a little bit of a uh, – I think I think it's more likely to go that way. But, um, all right, you guys are probably tired of hearing me talk about Ole Miss, so we are going to move on to the Arkansas side of this, which is a lot more fun because it's an actual baseball team, really good one, in fact uh, – First question I have of the weekend is just who the hell pitches in the bullpen? Now, in past weeks when I've asked that, it's been more of a, like, who's going to step up for Arkansas? Who's going to fill these roles? I'm not asking it in that way because I think we've learned in the last seven days or so, Arkansas has got a lot of bullpen options. Uh, I mean, just think about last night. Last night you bring in a guy in Cooper Dossett who hasn't pitched a ton Looks disgusting. Strikes out both hitters he faces. Jake Faraday hadn't made an outing in like a month. Former Bombastic Podcast guy. He walks the leadoff guy and then was one pitch away from having an immaculate inning after that. Just strikes out the side. The stri- The last strikeout he got was so disgusting. It was like an 88-mile-an-hour slider. Just painted on there, like right outside that route side corner. Uh, dude's throwing 95, 96. Like you see, Arkansas's got tons of options. I mean, Gage Woods, another one who comes out there, hadn't pitched in a while, goes out there and just looks lights out. Uh, I feel like there's another that I'm forgetting. Like who else pitched? Colin Fisher pr- pitched pretty well as well. Um, it just felt like you, know, you you just Arkansas just keeps developing these options. Uh, Parker Coyle also pitched uh, and pitched really well. Um, you know, so there's just then these are guys that didn't pitch the weekend before. When you did see Cooper Daw- or uh, Christian Fouch come in there, he also had a nice little appearance. Hunter Dietz makes his debut last week. 
he's going to be in the mix. So that's my question is like, not all of these guys are going to be able to pitch. You wouldn't think, um, but just how does that look? Like, will Arkansas mix and match? Will they just match up it? Will they just keep everyone to one inning? Uh, you know, last night, that's what Arkansas did, obviously, because it was a midweek game. It was more of like a bullpen sesh type of thing, uh, where it's kind of everybody just throwing one inning. I feel like Arkansas has the potential to do that. They have the skill sets to kind of mix and match with any threat that they're facing from an offense. So I just am continuing to be fascinated by just how does how do Matt Hobbs and Dave Van Horn go about knowing which options to deploy? Because it seems like at this point they've got legitimately like 10 to 12 dudes who you would realistically trust to go out there and pitch on the weekend. Uh, and, you know, Dylan Carter is another one. Oh, goodness. That's the dude I was missing. I was like, there was one more guy who threw really well last night. Dylan Carter was getting swings and misses with his fastball, lo- locating really well. Uh, his command seems to be like all the way back, and his command is really good. Uh, Arkansas just has options and options. And, of course, you know you have your guys like Will McIntyre and Cody Frank and Gabe Gackle, Stone Hewlett, who has been lights out for them. Uh, it's been really fun to watch this pitching staff operate. And I just feel like, you know, this is the best we've felt about the group all year long. I mean, from week one, we knew this pitching staff was really good. We knew coming into the season they were good. We knew the starting rotation in particular was dominant. Uh, but I feel like there's been different points in the year where maybe we've soured on some of these options like Gage Wood had some ups and downs uh Fouch had some ups and downs like other guys you know even Cody Franks had some ups and downs where it's like some weeks you feel a little bit better than others right now I don't know who I have any questions about in this Arkansas bullpen I think they have like legit 12 dudes they could use and uh you know it's it's super competitive I don't even know how they're going to go about making the 27 man roster I don't envy those coaches having to make that decision and having to inform some of these really talented players that they're not going to pitch. Uh, Ben Bybee, by the way, also threw really well yesterday. I think he only threw one inning, but he threw like 30 pitches. Um, We'll be interesting to see if they eventually weave him into the weekend fold. Uh, But again, I just like every two minutes, I just remember another option that just Arkansas has at their disposal. Uh, But moving on to question number two, which kind of could affect question number one a little bit. Brady Tiger, what's uh, what are, what are we feeling about Brady T right now? So for those that you know, just a little quick refresher, Brady Tiger at one point had the best ERA on this entire staff. I think going into SEC player, even after one SEC start, his ERA was still under one. It was like zero seven something going into that Auburn start, and uh, the Auburn start was probably his worst appearance of the year. Just the command wasn't really there. His stuff was a little bit down. He ends up leaving the game with a couple outs in the fourth inning. Wasn't able to give Arkansas really any like longevity there. So they give him an extra day to rest. They they switch him and Mason Molina in the order. He comes back this past week against LSU. Stuff was better, for sure. Fastball was touching 93, getting a ton of swings and misses on that patented curveball that he likes to throw. That 3,000 RPM curveball had a lot of bite to it. So the stuff was back. LSU made him pay for pretty much every mistake he made. They hit three home runs against him to score four runs. I felt like his outing was a little bit better than his final line indicated. But again, leaves after I think two. I think there was two outs in the third or in the fourth inning, uh, maybe the fifth inning. I can't remember. But he wasn't able to like kind of ex- give Arkansas an extended start. He only threw sixty eight pitches, which I feel like is notable. So he threw seventy four or seventy five against Auburn. They give him an extra day of rest. He pitches on Saturday last weekend and throws 68 pitches. He's going to pitch on Saturday again. I think this is a perfect opportunity to – it's a kind of like not a, not a make-or-break start because I think Brady Tiger is going to be helping this Arkansas pitching staff no matter what, like whether it's as a starter, bullpen, like whatever. Uh, and maybe if they just kind of use him as an opener where it's like he's starting the games, but they it's like a short leash type of situation, who knows. Uh, but I think this is a big chance for Brady Tiger to get back on track and maybe remind folks – hey, I can be a high-level pitcher. I can be a high-level starter. Uh, he's had some time to rest. We'll see how his arm feels. I haven't you know, spoken to anybody behind closed door about how he's feeling recovery-wise between his starts. I think that was a little bit of the concern last week is that you know, he wasn't feeling great, and so that's why they gave him that extra day of rest. And we'll see if, you know, stuff-wise, it definitely helped. His stuff was a lot better last weekend. But I would really like to see him come out and be sharp uh, maybe get through five innings. You know, I think that's a nice little barometer there. Like, can he just get through five innings, remind us how good he is, remind us what he can do for this team down the stretch. And uh, if you know Brady Tiger, you know, he's from Hernando, Mississippi, which is like 40 minutes away from Oxford. I remember Brady's freshman year, someone was asking him about it. 
and I don't believe Ole Miss offered him. I could be wrong, so Belinda, whoever, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think Brady, Ole Miss was like super heavily recruiting him. I know Mississippi State was after him. I don't know if Ole Miss offered him, and Brady Tiger is the type of guy who is, if you slight him in any way, shape, or form, he's going to hold that, you know, and remember that, and he's going to use that as motivation. I remember him his freshman year being like, yeah, every time I see those little powder blue jerseys, just gives me a little extra motivation. I love that. He pitched really well against Ole Miss as a freshman, I remember. Uh, so this will be you know, a nice moment against a, a team that he's familiar with, that he grew up close to home. This might mean a little bit extra. Uh, DVH kind of downplayed it whenever I asked him about it. He's like, oh, I'm not worried about the motivation. He's always motivated. But I know deep down to the Tiger family, this one has to mean a little bit more. Uh, and plus, just given how the last couple of weeks, I know that he's going to be super motivated to come out and have a good start uh, and really give Arkansas some more stability. I mean, it's not like this Arkansas pitching staff is in dire need of of another starter or like, you know, they, their top two guys are really good. So there's not a ton of pressure on Brady Tiger from that standpoint. But I think this would be a nice opportunity for him to kind of tell everyone to relax. Like, hey, I'm still clear. I'm in this rotation. I'm a dude. I'm just as good as anyone in the country whenever I'm on. Uh, it would give Arkansas fans a nice little boost of confidence that they were able to see Brady Tiger go out there, shut down a team that you know he really wants to shut down. And uh, I got to be honest, DVH actually kind of hinted. So this week is Arkansas, obviously another Thursday through Saturday series. Next week, I can't even remember who Arkansas plays next week, but it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So if you were going to make a move with your starting rotation and maybe switch up the order again or maybe move a different guy in, next week would be the time to do it. I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen here or that's you know something people we should be expecting, but I think if Brady Tiger comes out and struggles again this week, it makes you start at least experimenting with that and maybe having that conversation, which we could have next week on the pod if you guys want. Uh, but I think that you know Brady, it would be in his best interest, my opinion, just as a baseball guy, I think Brady Tiger should go ahead and just go out there and shove on Saturday, make everyone feel better, you know, bring some normalcy back here. And uh, he's fully capable. I'm not really worried about Brady Tiger at all. I think he's going to be fine. Uh, but also, the last question I have is just, you know, we we talked last week, like, is it is it baseball season? Like, what's going to be the takeaway? What's going to be the narrative or, like, story that we're all saying after Arkansas plays LSU? And after they played LSU, it was a pretty loud statement of, hey, this is the best team in the country. I feel like that was the narrative of, like, that was a as loud of a statement as you could make. To me, I see this series going one of three ways. I think Arkansas smoked either either Arkansas smokes Ole Miss, sends them into a little bit of a panic because for all the reasons I listed earlier of this program is not in a super stable spot. If they fall to three and nine in SEC play and get smacked around by Arkansas, that would be a little bit of an eye opening moment where I think you'd start seeing that Ole Miss fan base really start to heat up the flames a bit, and uh, things could get tumultuous for the Rebels down the stretch. I could also see Arkansas overlooking Ole Miss. You're facing a team that's coming off of an embarrassing sweep, so they're going to be highly, highly motivated. If Arkansas overlooks them, they they are more talented than their record and their numbers appear. Arkansas gets caught. Maybe Arkansas's first hiccup of the year. I think that would be fair to say. If Arkansas were to lose this series at home, I would say that's a pretty freaking big hiccup. Uh, that's that's a potentially a story option, or. Arkansas just kind of casually takes care of business, maybe drops game three or drops a game here and there, but they win the series two out of three. Uh, kind of like last year's series against Ole Miss where it's closer than they wanted it to be. They took two out of three. You survive in advance and move on. Uh, that would be by far the most boring option of the three <laughs> of the three I listed. Uh, perhaps it's the most, most, most realistic. For everyone's sake, for the fun of this program, for the fun of just talking – just don't do the third option there. We do not want to have a ho hum series victory here. Either sweep these cats or get swept. Like, just we want to have something to talk about. We need something to spice this up a little bit. Uh, personally, I think if you're just looking at this series on paper, I think there is a high, high, high possibility Arkansas sweeps here. I'm not breaking any news. Arkansas won 18 straight SEC games. Ole Miss is in a huge funk here. Arkansas plays well at home. On paper, Ole Miss doesn't have a good pitching staff. Their lineup isn't as good as some of the lineups that Arkansas has shut down already. Uh, I just don't see a ton of, you know, it doesn't really, on paper, if you're just simply going off the numbers, I don't see the case for why Ole Miss would win this series. That's just me. Um, can Arkansas make it as simple as just sweeping another team they're supposed to sweep? Um, who knows? Going into the McNeese State series, which actually it's just McNeese, not McNeese State, 
Uh, I think I named the, the episode that time, Arkansas should flex its muscle against McNeese. And I kind of urged Arkansas, hey, make this one easy. Go ahead and just sweep these dudes and don't even mess around. Uh, obviously, Ole Miss is a much more talented team than McNeese. But that's kind of my challenge to Arkansas. I was like, hey, this team is not nearly as good as you. Don't let them think they're as good as you. Just go ahead and smash them. You don't want to let the cockroach work its way and start crawling up your leg. You want to just go ahead and step on it. Don't have to worry about it and throw it away. Call it a day. Do not let Ole Miss come into Bomb Walker Stadium and pretend like they're on the same level. Go ahead and let them know the gap between where the two programs are at right now. Uh, plus, also, Arkansas should have plenty of motivation. I mean, this is a team that, frankly, you know, everyone talks about 2018 as like the year where it's like, oh, Arkansas should have won the national title and it got away from them. I think you can make an argument 2022 is the year that Arkansas really could have won the national title. I mean, if they get by Ole Miss, the Oklahoma team that was waiting for them was not going to beat them. Like that, that Oklahoma team was just happy to be there. They had kind of, you know, pieced together a little run there. But oh, that, that Oklahoma team wasn't very good. Ole Miss beat them pretty easily, pretty soundly. So I think you can make a real argument that Arkansas against Ole Miss in the semifinals that year was the real national title series, which Arkansas lost two out of three, technically, I mean, across four days. But uh, that was kind of like the the champion was decided then. And frankly, if you go back and look at it just a resume-wise, Ole Miss probably shouldn't have been in the damn tournament. And I don't mean the tournament as in in Omaha. They, you could make a real argument they shouldn't have been in the NCAA tournament to begin with. So, uh, hey, I'm not saying Arkansas should just go ahead and appeal these things, but I think if you're a fan looking for a reason to get psyched up for this weekend, Ole Miss pretty much took a national title from you. And a bad, not a bad Ole Miss team, because they, they had some talent on that team. Uh, I did, It wasn't even like a peak Ole Miss team to me, uh, and they took a national title from Arkansas. I feel like that should maybe uh, rub some fans the wrong way. DVH would never admit to something like this publicly, but I, that's got to be something that he thinks about, right? Uh, so I, I, I would, you know, Arkansas, the thing about them, and, and especially under DVH, is they usually don't tell you in the moment or, like, leading up to it when something is really personal to them, but you can always feel it. Like, that series against Tennessee in 2021, you could tell it was personal while it was happening. You could tell it was personal afterwards. They didn't go into the series saying, hey, this matchup with Tony V in Tennessee, these guys like to talk a lot of shit. This is personal. They don't say stuff like that because that's not what DBH does. That's not what this program does under him. They're quiet. They go about their business. But when they beat you and when they get one that's personal, you can usually kind of tell. Uh, I don't know if that's that's how they're viewing it. I'm, I know Bianco and DBH have a nice little friendship. Nice. They have a nice little working relationship, like a competitive relationship. I don't think there's any, any like bad blood between those two coaches, but like, I think when you're a situation like Arkansas is in where you're still trying to like prove that you are that number one team, you're still trying to prove that you are an elite program because uh, you don't have the national title to kind of solidify it, I think you got to look for any chance you can to make that statement. I would love to see Arkansas just come out here and whip these dudes. Uh, Ole Miss is, like I said earlier, just such an easy team to cheer against. And uh, I'm sure there's going to be some obnoxious Ole Miss fan that comments and is like, screw you or whatever, but it's like, you guys know it too. Like y'all, you know, the, the, the preppy, the preppy, like schoolboy attire and all that. Like, it's just very easy to make fun of Ole Miss, very easy to cheer against them. And, uh, and part of that is a credit to Ole Miss and just the success they've had in baseball. I mean, like I'm saying they stole the national title from Arkansas. Like that's a sign of respect a little bit, but like I said, there should be no lack of motivation for Arkansas this weekend at all. Uh, I think they should take this opportunity to kick their opponent while they are down um, before we get out of here, I do want to just go through a couple quick little notes that are on my on the top of my head. Uh, one, Peyton Holt, it's time to let it fly with him. DVH was this close. He was asked about Peyton Holt and how he's, you know, some of these guys in midweek games that have had some good games. Uh, Peyton Holt, one of those, he went two for four last night, drove in a run or two, I believe. Uh, DVH almost said, like, hey, he's he's really had some nice midweek performances and he stopped himself. He was about to say something and stopped himself. I don't know if he was about to say, hey, he kind of won me over. I'm going to start him over JSL. Uh, he mentioned JSL, J Jared Spreglot's defense and how valuable he is. But I think deep down they kind of know it's not over with at third base. That competition is still going on. We'll see if Peyton Holt's two-for-four night last night did enough to get him a start this weekend. Uh, Ole Miss could start two lefties, which now Holtz and Spreglot are both right-handed hitters. But I think if you were going to make that switch to like put the more offensive option in, you would do it against a lefty starter where you can think, hey, we could really take, we need to get a good right-handed bat in there to make, you know, make this team pay. 
Maybe this is a chance for Peyton Holt to get back in that mix. I would love to see it. I think he deserves to be in the lineup. That's not a knock on Jared Sprague a lot. I just think Peyton Holt is that guy. Let's see the Greenwood boy get back in there. Um, another thing I want to say, you need your stars to show up. So Arkansas is, you know, I, when I say stars, I have five guys listed here as Arkansas's stars in the lineup. Kendall Diggs, unquestioned star. Peyton Stovall, unquestioned star. Uh, ben McLaughlin, at this point, he's a star to me. Like, he's as consistent as anyone in the lineup. Hasn't been great in SEC play, if I'm being honest. I think he's hitting 200 in conference games through nine games. Uh, but has had some good moments. Had a really, really good night last night. Uh, hit a home, hit a huge home run, obviously. Went three for three, I believe. Um, feel like that maybe got him back on track. I want to see him put together a good weekend. And then Hudson White and Vahiva Aloy, who have been a little bit polarizing this year, but all offseason, those are the top two hitters on the team. Those are your two huge transfer additions, your catcher, your shortstop. Like last year, everybody was bitching so much about catcher and shortstop. Arkansas went out and got some real ones this year. I mean, I, let me let me go ahead and just correct the record there. When I say real ones, I mean like real blue chip. Like John Bolton, I thought did a, you know did his job at shortstop, but Arkansas went out there and got a name. They got the best shortstop in the portal. They got the best catcher in the portal. Those are stars for you. You need those guys to show up. And SEC play, both of those guys have been swinging it well. Uh, but we really those five names that I just listed: Diggs, Stovall, McLaughlin, White, Alloy. There has not really been a weekend where all five of those guys have been clicking at the same time. It's not like a huge deal. That's it's in baseball. It's unrealistic to have all your key pieces hitting well at the same time. It's just never going to work out that way. And if you if it does, it's a really special situation. But I would really love to see all five of those guys show up here and kind of just show us what the ceiling for this offense really looks like. Um, not going to hold it against them if they don't. I'm just you know I'm just just talking out loud here. Uh, another quick note I have is Hagen Smith. We don't we don't really talk about Hagen Smith a ton on this program, which is kind of funny considering he's like maybe the best player in the country. I'd say clearly the best pitcher in the country, and uh, very much in contention for every award you can name: SEC Player of the Year, SEC Pitcher of the Year, Golden Spikes, First Team All American, like all that stuff. Uh, Hagen Smith's right in the middle of it. And I feel like there's a lot of you know people from a national perspective who like if they only know one player in Arkansas, it's Hagen Smith. I was just thinking about it this morning where I'm like, man, I really never talk about Hagen on the program because when I'm talking to you guys, you guys know I'm preaching to the choir. I don't need to tell you at this point that Hagen Smith is really freaking good. You know that. Everyone knows that. But I did want to go ahead and mention it that like, uh, so Hagen's ERA in SEC play is a crisp 1-0-0. Crisp 1 SEC ERA. He's 3-0. He's got 32 strikeouts in 18 innings. Uh, I would say he's putting together a really – Really dominant year, but I also think he's on track to be SEC Pitcher of the Year, which is like, you know, may not mean anything to you guys, but that's a really cool achievement that, like, it's it's good for your program. You can have guys win that. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just cool stuff that weirdos like me, we care about. Um, so if, if Hagen is going to win the Golden Spikes, which are, we've had, Arkansas had plenty of guys win the Golden Spikes. Yeah, I say plenty. Andrew Benintendi and Kevin Copps, they've had two. But uh, they're one of, like, only a handful of programs who have had two. So it's, like, kind of a big deal. Uh, would really be cool to see Hagen Smith kind of get in that mix. I think he's in the top three candidates for sure. But if you are going to win a Golden Spice, win SEC Pitcher of the Year, all these things, every game matters. And so I'm just that's a, that's something I want to keep track of. Is like, does he is he still on pace for that kind of stuff? He goes out there. Last week was technically his worst start of the year. Gave up two whole runs in six innings of work. Only struck out ten. Like I mean. So, I mean, we'll see if we can get a bounce back star from Hagen Smith. Maybe he strikes out 14 and goes seven innings this time. But uh, I think it's just that's something for us to keep an eye on of just he's putting together this special year. How special can it be? We'll get an updated, like, stat counter on him and stuff like that. I think that's something, just another little nugget to, to keep out for. Uh, I also did want to mention Kendall Diggs. Do you all remember that Kendall Diggs was pretty much born against Ole Miss two years ago in that series I was referencing earlier? Uh, when he hit that walk-off home run, I feel like that was kind of the that was the day a lot of you guys probably found out who who Kendall Diggs was. Not to knock on you guys, I'm just talking about casual fans in general who are not following the program every single day and knowing every in and out. Uh, that was a huge moment where I felt like he kind of announced himself to Razorback country, and I would say for now he's probably like one of, if not the most beloved Razorbacks on campus right now in terms of just fan favorites and guys that you guys love and gets a standing ovation every time they say his name at Bomb Walker. A lot of that started against Ole Miss a couple years ago when he hit that huge three-run walk-off home run. 
So that's kind of just a, another thing to remember here as Arkansas hosts Ole Miss again. Uh, we'll see if he can continue to make another big statement against Ole Miss, but just kind of a fun thing. It's the first time he's faced Arkansas or faced Ole Miss at Baumwalker Stadium since then. So keeping out for that. Also, before I get out, I'm reaching right up the hour mark. Tomorrow, I will be having a bonus episode for you guys. Potentially. I don't want to guarantee it because it's like not 100. I haven't filmed it yet, but uh, negotiations have been made. Preliminary discussions have have played out. We are now into like heat, heated discussions, and we've got like a time and date set. Uh, I believe we are going to have a very special guest on the program tomorrow, a little special game day episode. Uh, it's it's kind of tough to get a player to come in on game day, but I got that happening tomorrow because uh, that's what we do around here. I've also got my buddy Daniel She. He's going to be helping me out with this one because he helped set this up. I want to give him his flowers. Daniel She's the man. We'll talk with him tomorrow, and we'll I'll give you a little bit more of a rundown there. But uh, y'all are going to enjoy that a lot. I think y'all are going to enjoy tomorrow's bonus episode. Uh, so, guys, continue to you know appreciate your support. I really appreciate it. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, do whatever you got to do. Tell your buddies to subscribe and like and all that. Uh, share this podcast with whoever you want to, but be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which you should be watching it on right now, The Bombastic Podcast on YouTube. If not, be sure you're subscribed to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast, we are there. So go check that out. Once again, guys, it's been a really fun episode. I'm Andrew Ellis. Thanks for tuning in. I will see you guys tomorrow for a special episode. Uh, let's go ahead and get this sweep. Talk to you guys soon.